Hello and welcome to this audiovisual presentation. In this presentation what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking at two of the areas within the, the larger area of social influence. So social influence describes the way in which our behaviour is influenced by those people around us. And in this particular audiovisual presentation I'm going to look at two types of influence that operate in that way. One is conformity and the second is compliance. Um, I'm going to try and offer you a few examples of how these two types of social influence work and I'm also going to be looking at some of the factors that make each type more or less likely to be effective. I'll also try to explore ways in which both conformity and compliance can be uh, applied to education. Before I talk about them though, there's one aspect of group dynamics I need to just recap first. Before I talk about group dynamics, um, I should point out that I'm recording this small segment uh, at the very end of having finished this entire presentation and it's turning out to be a longer presentation than I expected. As such, I recommend to you that unless you've got a lot of time and a lot of stamina to sit through this all in one go, it might be better to break this presentation up into two viewings or listenings uh, that you might maybe in your first go, just listen to the section on conformity, uh, and then leave it, and then come back on a second occasion and li listen to the second section on compliance. Trying to do both all in one sitting might tax even the most enthusiastic students. Now let's come back to the topic I was going to talk to you about, which is focusing or recapping on one particular area of group dynamics, specifically the area of norms. One of the concepts that we looked at when we talked about group dynamics were norms. Group norms are effectively the, the rules of the group, the things that the group expects of group members. All groups have norms, sometimes the norms are very formal, they're written down in a constitution or a set of rules or policies. Sometimes the rules, the norms are more informal, an understanding among all the different people in the group that this is what is considered to be uh, appropriate behaviour, appropriate ways of acting or talking or dressing by group members. It's from this concept of norms that we get the expression normal. That when somebody's doing something which fits in with the norms of the group, we would say that was normal behaviour. So for example, it's normal that most people would, when they get up in the morning, take off the clothes that they wore that night, you know, they're pyjamas or whatever, and put on a new set of clothes to walk around in the daytime. That's considered to be normal behaviour. It's less normal in most situations for people to continue wearing their night clothes during the daytime. So it would be, in most places, it would be slightly unusual or abnormal for me to go down the shops in my pyjamas. That being said, there are some places and some groups for whom wearing pyjamas during the day has become a normal thing. And this is, again, one of the interesting things about norms. Different groups have different norms, and sometimes what is normal in one group is very abnormal in another group. Now, when we looked at norms, we didn't really explore too much how norms affect our behaviour, the, the, the mechanism by which it happens. And we also didn't consider whether or not norms affect us all equally, or if they affect us the same way in different situations. And it's that's something we're going to be looking at in this lecture, how our tendency to follow the norms, which is conformity, applies more in certain situations than others. And also we'll explore why is it that we follow the norms? What is it that makes us want to do what other people are doing, follow the, the behaviour of the group rather than just doing our own thing? To understand conformity, let me put you into a hypothetical situation. Imagine, if you will, that I ask you to take part in a study, and I tell you it's a study about perception. And uh, I put you in a dark room, it's completely dark, you can't see anything, except there's one single point of light, like a little dot, which you can see at the other end of the room. And that's all you can see, nothing else, just that one dot. And I ask you to stare at the dot for a certain amount of time and then to report to me afterwards about what you see. Now, one of the interesting things 
but you or anybody else will find if you try this for yourself, put yourself in a completely dark room with a single point of light, is that if you stare at the light, after a while, it will start to look like the light is moving. Now, if you're the one who set up the light, you'll know it's not really moving. It's a, what they call a visual illusion. Your brain is telling you something's happening which isn't happening. And one of the reasons you sort of think it's moving when it's not is that there's no point of reference. There's nothing else around the light to show you that it's stationary or it's moving. And since our eyes tend to move around a lot, even when we're staring at one thing, our eyes never stay completely still, they move a little bit. Those little eye movements, we think, create the illusion of the dot moving. And uh, this is known as the autokinetic effect. Right, so let's go back to my sort of imaginary study that you're taking part in. I put you in the room, I asked you to watch the dot, and then afterwards I asked you to tell me if the dot moved. Now, if you didn't know about the autokinetic effect, you would say, yeah, the dot did move. In fact, almost everybody says this. Now that's a phenomenon, the autokinetic effect, which we've known about for decades. The first person to point it out goes, you go way back to, to Adams in 1912. But what's interesting and where it starts to get relevant to the thing we're looking at today is that if you heard somebody else who is sitting in the same room as you saying, yeah, I saw it move, then you'd be much more likely to agree. And in fact, you might say, be much more certain that it did move because you heard somebody else say it too. On the other hand, if somebody else in the room said, no, it didn't move at all, even if you thought it did move, even if the illusion worked for you and you thought it did move, you'd be a little bit less confident in saying it moved because the situation is so ambiguous and you might start to doubt yourself. And so what this shows us is that our judgment is often influenced by the judgment of people around us. If they say something did happen, we're much more confident to say, yeah, it did. If they say it didn't happen, we're less confident, especially when the situation is ambiguous. And it's that key issue. How do we make judgments? What do we do when a situation is ambiguous? That brings us to the first place where conformity, us doing what other people are doing, really kicks into gear. Now, the researcher who first established this important issue of what do we do when we're not certain what the right thing to do is and how we rely on other people to make those judgments was a researcher known as Sharif. Now, you may see on the slide there's a picture of a famous Hollywood actor known as Omar Sharif, and there's also a picture of a sheriff's badge. And this is because there's a little bit of uncertainty about how to pronounce the researcher's name. Some people call them Sharif, some people call them Sheriff. Um, I've looked for some answers to this online and it's one of the play times when the internet has actually let me down. There is no, as far as I can find, no definitive answer. Uh, however, I find more people pronounce it Sharif, so that's the way I'm going to pronounce it. However you pronounce their name, Sharif carried out what has become one of the iconic studies in this area of psychology. They use the autokinetic effect I've just described, putting people in a dark room and asking them to judge how much a light was moving. And they didn't just ask them, did it move? They tr asked them to judge how much it was moving, mm. uh, what distance it travelled. Now what they found, what Sharif and the other researchers in this area found, was that if everybody was asked this question on their own, they tended to come up with very different answers, it seems that some people are more or less affected by this illusion. But when you put people all in the same room together, both in terms of viewing the dot and then later giving their judgment about how much it moved, Sharif found that gradually their answers started to converge. It's almost as if each person was just listening to what the other people had said and adjusting in their own head their own answer. And the way that Sharif explained this was that in a, in a situation where we, are, where we are uncertain about what the right thing to do is, we use other people as a reference. We kind of use them to gather information about the situation. So we gather information ourselves by 
what we see and what we judge to be the right thing to do, but then we also look at what other people are doing and they're another place that we get information about what's going on and what the right thing to do is. So for example, imagine you're sitting in a classroom and the fire alarm goes off. Now, is it a fire alarm or is it just a drill? Well, one thing you'll do is you'll look around to see what other people in the room are doing. If they're sitting there looking unflustered, reading a newspaper, you'll think, oh, it's probably a drill. They don't seem worried. There's nothing to worry about. On the other hand, if everybody instantly jumped to their feet and started running around and getting excited, you'd probably do the same thing, thinking, gosh, wow, this really must be a fire because look how, how everybody else is reacting. Sharif described this as informational influence, that basically other people's behaviour can have an impact on us because it's a source of information for us, particularly in situations where the, the situation is ambiguous, where we're not certain of what the right thing to do is or not certain of what, what's going on. And this is a form of conformity. Essentially the behaviour of other people is influencing, influencing us because it's a source of information for us. Now, this describes how, when we're part of a group, we're likely to end up behaving similar to other people in the group, and they're likely to end up similar to us, because each of us is using the other person as a, a reference point. We're judging our behaviour based on what other people are doing. We do this all the time, and this is how norms can emerge without anybody guiding them or establishing them. Um, so in Sharif's study, he didn't have anybody leading the group and saying, I think this is how much it moved. People just gave their views and gradually uh, a consensus emerged. So in groups too, some of the norms that a group has, nobody sat down and decided them, they just emerged as people used each other as this kind of point of reference that informational influence is talking about. Also when you join a group for the first time, maybe the first time you came to uh, university, the first time you went to school, the first time you walked into a classroom, you looked around to see what other people were doing. And nobody had to tell you the norms of behaviour, you just observed them and judged your behaviour based on theirs. So we use this all the time to guide our behaviour. It does raise a very interesting question though. What would we do in a scenario where it is clear what the right thing to do is? Would we still use other people as a reference point then? Well that was a question that was explored by a different researcher in what was an, what became an equally iconic study. It would be some 15 years later after Sharif's original study that we would finally get an answer to that question as to what people would do in a situation which was unambiguous. Would they still go along with what everybody else was doing or would they follow their own judgment? And in order to set that situation up, Ash designed a very different study from the one that Sharif did. In Sharif's study, it was an ambiguous situation and everybody who took part was a real participant. They weren't in on it. They were essentially giving an honest answer to what they thought was going on in terms of the, the spot moving or not. However, in Ash's study, Ash gave the groups uh, a question where there was a clearly right and wrong answer. So you can see an example of one of those on the screen where there's a target line on the left on its own and then there's three comparison lines on the right and the group is being asked which of the comparison lines is closest in, in length. It's the same length as the target line. Now looking at the lines on the screen my guess is that you're probably torn somewhere between A and C. I would say you think it's either A or C is the same length as the target line. But I doubt very many of you are picking B. I'd say most of you are fairly confident that whether or not A or C is the right answer, B is definitely the wrong answer. And um, this is similar to the situation that Ash presented to the, the people to see what their choices would be. The other thing he did though was that he put the people together where only one person in the group was actually a participant, didn't know what was going on, was giving an honest answer based on what they thought. The other people in the group were all confederates. A confederate is someone who's secretly working with the, the researcher uh, undercover, if you like. The other participants don't know they're working with the researcher, and the confederate has usually been 
given a particular script to follow, something they've been asked to do in order to produce a situation so that the researcher can see what effect that has on the participant. So in this case, in the groups of four or five or however many people, all of the people in the group, except for one, were Confederates. They were in on it. And only one person in each group was a real participant. And usually the real participant was going last in terms of picking their answer. And so they would get to see what all the other people in the group, who they thought were participants as well, uh, they got to see what answer they picked first. And the idea was to see if the Confederates consistently picked an answer, would the participant go along with them? And also the, the researchers were interested to, see, interested to see how far they could push this, you know, how, how obviously wrong could the answer be and still have people go along with it. But also um, when they talked to them afterwards they wanted to find out for those people who did go along, why did they go along? Um, and so that was the test. Now in order to compare it against a, what they would call a control group they um, did it once where all the participants in the group were real participants. So everybody in the group was a participant, nobody was in on it and they were allowed to pick whatever they liked. And they found in those situations uh, it was very unlikely that anybody picked the wrong answer. So they used that to show that there was a fairly unambiguously wrong answer that people didn't pick under normal situations. Now they then did the study again but this time with the Confederates basically all but one person is Confederate and in on it and all the Confederates have been told to pick the wrong answer and the idea is to see does the one participant go along with them. Uh, now what they found was that surprisingly quite a lot of people about a third of people who participated were willing to go along with the Confederates and pick the wrong answer even when the wrong answer from an objective point of view was very clearly wrong. So there was no ambiguity, it was a wrong answer, but they still went along with it if that was the answer all of the other people in the group who were Confederates, as if that's what they picked. Now when Ash and his researchers talked to the people afterwards, the real participants afterwards, and asked them why they picked the answer they did, he was interested to find that a small minority of the people who went along with the Confederates actually claimed to have seen a line that was the same length as the target line in the answer they picked. So even though the, uh, the line they were picking was very clearly not the same length, they claimed they had seen it being the same length. They were so convinced that the Confederates were right that they had almost edited their memory and in their memory the line they picked was the right length. So that's how powerful the, the belief was that the Confederates were right and going along with them was the right choice. That It actually caused them to almost distort their memories and distort their perceptions. Now there's an interest in this, a second group um, who had a sense that the line, these are people who went along with the Confederates, they had a sense that the line the Confederates were picking was wrong, but they just didn't have confidence in their own judgment. And they decided that if all these other people thought it was the right answer, it must be the right answer, and they went along with it. They ignored their their fears and they ignored their, their doubts. Um, and then again focusing just on the people who went along with the Confederates uh, a large number of other people could see that the Confederates were wrong were confident that the Confederates were wrong you remember they don't see these people as Confederates they just see them as other participants of the group but they, they believed the group's choices were wrong they were confident that the group's choices were wrong so there, were, there weren't any doubt that it was the wrong answer but they still went along with it and the reason they gave is that they, they didn't want to be didn't want to cause any disagreements. They didn't want to sort of be seen to be disagreeing with the group. Um, and so you can see there that there's, there's different levels of how much people are going along with the group. So people are, are going along heart and soul. They're actually almost distorting what they see and what they remember in order to fit in with the group. Others are less confident but still um, uncertain of themselves and even the people who are certain of themselves still might go along with the group because they don't want to <coughs> excuse me they don't want to um, sort of be seen to be rocking the boat and um, so what we're seeing here is that it's not about using the other people as information it's about really wanting to fit in 
You could say that people in the second group who were sort of uncertain of the right answer and went along with the group, they're still sort of operating pretty much like the people in, in Sharif's study were. They're uncertain, so they go along with the, uh, with the majority. But then you have those people who can see that the majority are wrong, but they still go along with them. And they're doing it because they want to fit in. They're doing it because they don't want to be seen to be different, to, to be seen to be disagreeing with the majority. And so this is a different kind of conformity influence. It's not informational influence, and it's become known as normative influence, the, the pressure to fit in, the pressure to go along with the norms. Um, and if you think about it, that's a pressure we all feel. I know we like to think that it's uh, you know, teenagers or kids who are affected by peer pressure, but we all feel the pressure to be normal, to fit in, to do what other people are doing. And if you have any doubt of that, think of the, uh, the word abnormal or deviant. Someone who's abnormal is someone who doesn't follow the norm. Someone who is deviant is deviating from the norm. Think about what those words mean in our society and you can see exactly why people are so afraid of breaking with the norms of the group and being seen to be different. From these two studies, a whole host of other studies have emerged and there are in entire areas of research exploring these different kinds of conformity. But um, while they continue to add to what we know about conformity, by and large we are still finding that conformity generally falls into one of the two types that I've described so far. So conformity, which is kind of going along with the, the behavior of the group, changing your attitudes or changing your behaviors to match the group's attitudes and behaviors, that that generally happens for one of two reasons, either because uh, you're using the other people in the group as a sort of reference point and gaining information, informational influence, and that tends to happen when um, the situation is uncertain or there's a crisis, um, or when you perceive the other people as being more expert than you are. So if you think they know more than you do, then you, you go along with them, and that's informational influence. And the other kind of influence, which is what we saw in, in Ash's study, and ones like it, is normative influence, where basically people are afraid of being seen to be different, of being seen to disagree with the group, or just stand out, or do something different from what the other group, others in the group are doing. So they, are, they want to gain approval, to please others, to fit in, to be part of the group, and so they they do what the other people in the group are doing, and that's normative influence. Um, and it's interesting that um, over time it seems that conformity will change, that while we might start off doing what other people are doing because we want to fit in, we want to belong, so you could call that identification, we identify with them, we feel you're, our, you're, I'm, you're one of us, or I'm one of you, yeah, you're my kind of people, and so you do what they're doing because you, you want to belong, you want to fit in. However, researchers have found that over time, you begin to internalize the norms. So it's no longer about wanting to fit in at all. It's These norms have become part of your value system, and so you do it as an expression of your identity. Uh, you could say it's an expression of your social identity, but you no longer worry about fitting in or not fitting in. To you, these norms are the way that people should live their life. And I think we all get to that point, certainly with the groups that we belong to for the longest, like our family and maybe our community or ethnic group, that the norms of those groups have been with us for so long they've become part of who we are. And so we no longer uh, sort of consciously care about whether or not we fit into the group or not. These, these are our values and uh, we think that to follow them is to express who we are. There, that being said, it's not always the case that we all conform the same amount or that even one person is going to conform to the same level in all situations. So even the groups we really care about and really belong to, want to belong to, like our family usually, there are different aspects of our family that we conform to more than others. There are situations where we are more likely to go along with the, the norms of our group, our family, our friends, our community, compared to others. And so this is another area that researchers have uh, tried to explore. Now there are too many factors which, uh, which affect levels of conformity for me to talk about them all. So what uh, you're seeing here on the slide is a sort of highlight of some of the, the best known or some of the ones that are considered to be, have the, the biggest influence. For example, generally speaking, 
the size of the group has been shown to increase conformity as the group gets bigger, but very quickly it seems that adding more people does not increase levels of or produce greater levels of conformity. And you reach that sort of maximum effect quite early on, even after only about three or four or even five people. If they're all sort of going along with a rule and all doing the same thing, that produces the maximum effect in terms of group size, that seven, eight, nine upwards doesn't seem to increase levels of conformity. Um, it's important though that big or small the group is unanimous, that basically everybody in the group is doing the same thing or everybody in the group agrees. If you have dissenters, if you have people in the group who aren't following what the rest of the group is doing, it reduces the level of conformity dramatically. So Ash did a, another study where one of the confederates was ordered to disagree with the others, to produce a different answer to the others, and it found that this dramatically reduced the levels of conformity in the participants. Now what was interesting is the participants didn't all start going along with the person who disagreed, they didn't start matching their answer either. But it was the fact that someone disagreed almost gave the participants permission to be different, permission to have their own views, and so levels of conformity drop, drops dramatically in that situation. Now this is a very powerful argument in favour of free speech in our society, that even if the person being given the free speech is using it to say things you would find uh, you passionately disagree with or you file, find repellent, the idea that they're being given the chance to speak freely is a positive thing because it sends a message to everybody else in the society that they too can disagree, they too can have their own views and don't have to conform to what the majority think. So difficult as it is to give some groups that their sort of pulpit from which they can say the things they say, I think we can all appreciate how it gives license to all of us to have a, a different viewpoint. And the same is true in education, that if we um, allow students a chance to speak out, to have their say, uh, even if we think the student themselves isn't giving the right answer or isn't saying something we personally agree with, it's a very powerful message to send to the others that they too can have their own viewpoints. Um, we tend to be much more likely to conform if the behaviour that's going to be indicating the conformity or not conformity is a public one that everybody else can see. So uh, if people are going to be able to see you do it or that you don't do it, you're much more likely to conform, whereas if it's a private behaviour, you're much less likely to conform, which is a good argument for, for example, voting to be a private uh, behaviour so that people don't feel pressured to, go to vote the way everybody else is voting. Um, the more we want to belong to the group, the more we care about the group, the more that we feel, the more tight-knit the group is and the people in the group want to belong to us, the more they're going to conform. Uh, so this is what cohesiveness is all about. Now we see a danger in that uh, when we talk about something like groupthink, where people care more about conforming to the norms of the group than actually thinking carefully about what the group is doing, and so the group can end up doing making incredible mistakes because people are more worried about conforming than they are about being sort of critically aware of the, the rightness of their actions. Um, there's some suggestion that sort of personal factor like your culture or your gender might affect um, your levels of conformity. So research a number of years ago suggested that certain cultures were more likely to conform uh, and there was research for many years which suggested that women were more likely to conform than men were. However, both of these claims have been challenged more recently, and it's been suggested that possibly the, the type of task being selected might produce more conformity in certain groups. So it's not that the group itself is inherently more likely to conform, but rather that for any group there might be certain tasks on which that group are more likely to conform. And usually with gender any it was found to be tasks which were perceived to be appropriate for the opposite gender that each gender conforms more on. So if the task is perceived to be one that women normally do or women normally are good at, men tend to be more conformist on that task, whereas if the task is more masculine, more oriented towards males and male strengths or what are perceived to be male strengths, then women conform on it more. And that would suggest that it's not about the gender of the person but rather whether or not they feel confident in the task. And if it's a task in which they don't feel confident, they're more likely to conform, do what the, the majority do, because they don't, I guess, feel 
they have the confidence to be different. Um, lastly, you might say status um, affects levels of conformity. Typically, high status people tend to um, be more likely to embody the norms of the group. Um, but often that's because they get to set the norms themselves. An interesting thing about status, though, is that a very high status person seems to be given more leeway to be different. Now, we'll get back to that in a, in a minute when we talk about minority influence, but it seems that if you're high status and you conform in most ways, you're given permission to be different in certain ways. It's a, a sort of a perk of the high status position you're in. You're allowed to break the rules on certain things. Up until now, we've tended to present conformity as something that happens when the majority of people cause the minority or the individual to change their behaviour in order to go along with the norms of the majority. So it's kind of been presented as being sort of a strength in numbers. Uh, if you have the majority of people on your side, then you can make the other people or the other individual change their behaviour to match you. Um, <coughs> now this tends to be, happens a lot, particularly when the um, the majority are unanimous, they all sort of agree on the norm, but it also tends to be much more dramatic when the, the norm is considered to be an important one, something that's very essential to the values of the group, then there's a quite a considerable amount of pressure on the individual or the minority to, to conform to the norm. And especially if the norm has been made explicit, if, if you're aware that it's a norm, if you know that you're supposed to follow it, under those situations you feel the greatest pressure to go along with the, the majority and do what they're doing. But there are a number of cases where this system seems to almost run in reverse, where you have a minority of people establishing a new norm and winning over the majority, causing the majority to change their norms until everybody shares the norm of the minority. Now, I don't necessarily mean minority in the sense that it's often used in everyday society, meaning a sort of ethnic group or a religious group or a gender group. I just mean that you have a smaller number of people convincing the larger number of people to change their norms. And this is what Muscovici and others have called minority influence. Now, as with any situation where there seems to be an exception to the rule, because majority influence does work most of the time, those cases where there's an exception, they must follow our rule as well. And through researching sometimes very famous cases of minority influence, like you see here, the suffragettes or the civil rights movement, um, but uh, also sometimes less dramatic cases in the workplace and elsewhere, Muscovici and others have identified what they believe are the um, characteristics of the minority group which allow them to sometimes cause the majority to change. Um, now you can see some of them summarised here on the screen. Commitment, what's called idiosyncrasy, credit and dissent. But let me explain to you what those mean. Um, so firstly, commitment. If the minority are seen to be devoted to their cause, committed to it completely, heart and soul, this makes them very influential. And this is particularly the case for minority groups where belonging to the group that they belong to is likely to cost them something, it is likely to require sacrifice for them. So that, that may mean they're disadvantaged, it may mean they're even locked up or socially outcasts, or there may be financial or physical costs. But the more that the person seems to have to pay or suffer or you know, sacrifice in order to be part of the minority group, the more we are influenced by the minority group. And it makes sense. If you think, wow, that person really has given up a lot to be part of that group, you respect them for it, and so you're more likely to listen to them. Um, it's interesting, though, that the minority group, generally speaking, are not, if you like, breaking the norms for the, all of the norms that the group belong to. Usually it's one particular norm that they are breaking or trying to redefine. And what's interesting is that usually the people in the minority group on all of the other norms of the group, they're very much people who go along with those norms. In fact, they are often to seen to be very enthusiastically supporting all the other norms of the group, except this one norm where they are people who are 
disagreeing and seeking to change things. And so it's believed that by following all the other norms of the group so uh, dutifully, by being good group members and following all the rules so carefully in every other case, they earn the right to be different on this one issue. Uh, it's called, sometimes called idiosyncrasy credit and it's similar to the point I made a few minutes ago about uh, people who are high status in the group, that if you're seen to be a good group member, someone who goes, plays by the rules on almost every rule, you're given a free pass, permission almost, to be different in one way, as long as you have a good reason for it. The last issue where the minority has to fulfil the requirement if they want to be influential is similar to the majority in that there can't be much in the way of dissent within the group. The minority must be seen to be internally consistent, that everybody within the minority is in agreement on how the norm should change for whatever norm they're seeking to change. So a group that can achieve that, that can be seen to be incredibly internally consistent, making great sacrifices to be in the group, and also who in almost every other way are seen to be good team players and group members for the larger majority group, that minority can be incredibly influential. Um, and we've seen many examples of it uh, throughout history. Those are the sort of points I wanted to talk about in relation to conformity, but conformity is only one of the two forms of influence I want to talk about today. And the next one, compliance, is a very different form of influence where we're generally being influenced by a single person rather than a group. But before we consider what compliance is, let me uh, ask you a question. Imagine that you're in a situation where you need a favour. You, you need something, uh, you need help usually from another person. And you, whatever the favour is, you really can't afford that for them to say no. You need their help badly. So you're going to have to pull out all the stops. Do everything. You can't make them do it. You can't force them to do it. But you're going to need to do everything you can think of to increase the chances that their answer is going to be yes. So what are you going to do? Now we've all been in this situation in the past where we've really needed a favour, we've really needed something from somebody and we've tried and tested different methods which we think are effective in getting people to agree. Have a think about what works, pause the recording, make a few notes and then when you're ready we'll continue. Right, hopefully at this point you've, you've got your list of uh, tips and tricks, the great uh, techniques you've tried in the past to wrap people around your little finger. Now, keeping that list in mind, let's now have a look at the methods that researchers have identified to, uh, to help us achieve this. Because, who knows, you may recognise some of the things you already do and you might even learn a few new tricks. Okay, you've got your list of tips and tricks for getting wrapping people around your little finger. So what, are, what is this that we're talking about here? Well, it's, it's social influence because you are trying to change the behaviour of another person. They weren't going to do this thing anyway, whatever it is you want them to do. It wasn't something they were already going to do. So you're trying to get them to do it, which is trying to get them to change their behaviour from not doing the thing to doing it. Um, and so we're talking about social influence, but what kind of social influence? Is it obedience? Well, it's only obedience if you're using some kind of power you have over them to make them do it. So if you're using the threat of punishment or that you might withhold a reward, then that's obedience. And we know the difference. We know the situations where we can say no if we want to and the situations where we can't. So if your boss says to you, I know, I want you to stay late, work late this evening, even though they may phrase it as a request, it's your boss, there's an implied power issue there that if you say no, bad things might happen to your career, so you stay late. That's not compliance, that's obedience. On the other hand, when your friend says, hey, can you help me pack up some boxes because I'm moving house next week, they don't have any hold over you, there's no power they have over you, that's compliance. On the other hand, it's not conformity because usually it's one person who's making the request so we're responding to one person not a group of people 
Uh, and so if a group of people ask us for help, then it might be compliance, but it could also be conformity if it's a group we want to belong to. So for true compliance, it's one person who doesn't have any hold or any power over us asking us to do something. Do we agree? There's a couple of things that the person can do to make us more likely to agree. Now, you've come up with a few ideas yourself, so let's see if I can describe a few of them in informal terms. What are they called in the research? Well, look to, down your list. Did you have any examples where, in a sense, you were going to return the favour? That if they did this thing for you, you would be happy to do the same in return at some point in the future, or you'd be happy to do a similar favour, something they want in the future. If you have a version of that, then congratulations, you are using one of the most effective and widely used methods for achieving compliance, which is the promise of reciprocity. And reciprocity is effectively the word which describes the idea that when you receive something, you will then be committed to giving something of equivalent value or similar back in return. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Now it's interesting that reciprocity itself, the following the rules of reciprocity, is considered to be a norm in most groups. In most groups it's considered to be if you agree to some kind of arrangement where there's reciprocity is expected, you can't back out. And someone who does that, someone who accepts a favour but then won't offer you one in return, is breaking one of the rules of the group, which is that you must honour your commitments, you must return the favours that you've received. And if you don't, the person who doesn't do that is likely to fall foul of the group and could even be ostracised for the group for breaking the group's norms. That being said, the actual favour they're doing for you is not because of conformity. I know that's confusing because following the rules of reciprocity is a norm and so there is conformity there pressuring them to follow the norm. However, the particular thing they're doing for you, whatever that is, they're not doing that for normative reasons. They're doing that because of the promise of reciprocity. So if I help you move house, it's not because I feel pressure to conform and do that. I'm doing it on the understanding that I help you and in the future you'll help me. And that's reciprocity and that's compliance. Now, making you honour that commitment, that's conformity. There's pressure to do that from the group. What are the other techniques that work? Well, possibly you had something in there which described laying a guilt trip on somebody or making somebody feel guilty. And usually what we're doing there is we are reminding somebody of um, their commitment to the group. In a sense, it's almost like saying, come on, you're a group member, we're in this together, how could you not help out a fellow group member? How could you not um, help your brother when he really needs you? How could you not be there for your best friend in his hour of need? Um, how could you not help me after all those times I've helped you? So in a sense, we are reminding them of their commitment to the group. We are reminding them of past uh, cases where we've helped them. So a little bit of reciprocity to, to it as well. But primarily, guilt is usually about reminding people of their commitments to the group. And that's why it only works if it's a group that they really care about and if it's a group that you and they both belong to. You can't really lay guilt trips on sort of casual acquaintances. It only works for people where you have a very tight-knit group, family or friends, and there's an expectation in the group that you all help each other out. So that's why guilt works. In case you've ever wondered why your parents are always able to lay a guilt trip on you, it's because of that uh, close-knit family bond that you have. The third method, which is very popular and very effective in terms of increasing compliance, is collectively known as ingrati ingratiation. Now, ingratiation means essentially increasing your appeal to the other person, making yourself look more appealing to them. And there's a number of ways that you can do that. Um, so I've listed some of them on the screen here. For example, flattery gets you everywhere, as the saying goes, and it works. And flattery makes you look good because you make them feel good. It's the same really with bribery, that by giving them a good feeling, you increase their sense of sort of well-wishing towards you and you make yourself look better by doing it. 
Now those are the obvious ways that you can increase your appeal to another person, but there's other less obvious ways. One, for example, is through revealing things about yourself, particularly if you reveal something about yourself that's a vulnerability or a weakness, that's self-deprecation. By putting yourself down, you're sharing something that's private, a weakness. And in fact, sharing anything that's private often makes you look better to that person that you're sharing it with. The reason being that by sharing something private, you're marking them out as somebody special. You're saying, look, I can trust you with this information. This isn't something I tell lots of people. I'm only telling you this. And you make them feel special. And that makes them feel good. And that, again, makes you look good in their eyes. The last method of ingratiation is one that is very subtle, but incredibly effective. And that is approval or agreement. The more that we approve something that somebody says, the more that we agree with them, again, the more they feel better about themselves. Everybody likes to hear their own views being confirmed, their own beliefs being repeated back to them. They like to be told that they're right. They like to be told that they're doing the right thing, that they're a good person. And so agreement with somebody will generally make that person feel good. And again, anything that makes them feel good makes you look better in their eyes and makes uh, them more likely to agree with, to your request. One thing you'll notice about all of these techniques that I've described so far is that they require for some pre-existing connection or relationship to exist between the two people. I mean, this is definitely true for reciprocity and guilt where there needs to be an established connection. The two people need to be both part of a, a social group that's fairly cohesive and has got good norms of reciprocity and a past history in order to use that as ammunition for guilt for these methods to work. Even ingratiation, while that can be used on people you don't know very well, it's less effective because it's more obvious if someone who doesn't know you at all suddenly starts flattering you or uh, revealing things about themselves or dressing themselves down. Um, and as such, there still needs for them to be effective. There still needs to be some connection between the two people. But it raises the question then of how do we achieve compliance in a situation where we don't know the person well at all, where we're, they may be part of a group that's only just formed or a group in which there's very low cohesiveness, not much of connection between the people in the group. How do we achieve compliance under those scenarios? Well, the best place to learn from that is to learn from the pros. And by that, I mean uh, salesmen and women. When you consider the act of selling something, it's a form of social influence. You want somebody to change their behavior from just being a browser to being someone who actually buys the product. And the methods that salespeople use to achieve this are methods of compliance. Now, they're using a particular type of compliance or a particular method to achieve it which is often known as a multiple request strategy. But we can learn a lot from these if we want to um, use compliance in a variety of situations, including education. Before I explain to you how it works, let me show you an example of a, a sales pitch, in this case, an online one. Here's an example of the kind of uh, advertisement or promotion you might see on one of these sites designed to help you compare different mobile phone deals. It's a little bit dated now, I think. Uh, both uh, the phone in question and even the company that is offering it are both no longer in circulation, but it doesn't matter. The principles here, you can see different phone deals, uh, different packages, different costs, all being offered on the same page. Now, have a look at it and ask yourself, of the deals being offered here, which one of them looks the best? Which one jumps out at you as being a, a good deal? And if whichever one it is for you, why do you think that one looks the best to you now? What do you think that they have done to present the deal in such a way as to increase your chances of picking it, which would be an example of compliance. They, they want you to, to do something in the way everybody who's trying to get you to comply wants you to do something. In this case, they want you to buy a certain mobile phone. I would argue that they're actually even trying to steer you towards a particular deal. It's not just any deal they want you to buy. There are ones that they're more keen than others for you to pick and I'll show you how they steer you in a few minutes. But just look at the deals, maybe pause the recording, have a think about which one you like and what is it about the offer that makes you like it. Okay, so you have some idea in your head now about which deal appeals to you and maybe some ideas about what it is that they've done to make it appeal to you. Now I'll just talk to you about the, the theory behind it and then we'll, in a couple of slides, see that theory applied 
to this example so you can see how it works in action. All of these multiple request strategies, or sometimes called sequential request strategies, have one thing in common, which is that they all involve the person who's trying to get you to comply making an initial request which is not the thing they really care about. The initial request is just being used to increase your chances or increase the chances of you agreeing to the target request, the thing they really do care about, which will follow the initial request. And so the whole purpose of the initial request is one of two things. Either it's trying to get you committed to a course of action by getting you to do something small, which they'll follow up with something larger. And the idea there is that by getting you to agree to the small thing, you, without realising in your own mind, commit yourself to going along with them. And so when they follow it up with a bigger request, the one they really care about, you feel like you can't back out. You feel like you'd be being inconsistent or being rude. The other effect of this initial request followed by a target request is that the initial request can change the way you look at the follow-up request. It can cast it in a new light. And uh, that's called framing, where you make the person look at the follow-up request in a different way because you they are usually comparing the follow-up request with the initial request and in some way that comparison makes the follow-up request look more attractive. Let me give you some examples of this. So let's look at the examples where the initial request is designed to kind of get you hooked, to sort of commit you to a course of action which you then feel you can't or shouldn't back out of. One example of this is foot in the door. You get people to agree to any small initial request. It doesn't matter what it is. They just agree to do something, agree to take something from you, usually a free sample. The people in supermarkets who are giving out free samples. The purpose of the free sample is not just to kind of, so you'll taste the product and go, hmm, I want to buy that. But it also gets you to agree to do something. You're agreeing to take a free sample. And the minute you agree to that, without realising it, you feel like you are now in some way connected to the person who's asking you. And so when they follow it up with the target request, can you please buy a, a, this new product we're selling? You feel that because you agreed to the, the initial request, you can't back out now. It would be rude, it would be wrong. You'd be being inconsistent, you'd be being unreliable. I mean, it's a strange thought, because all you've agreed to is a free sample, but you still feel committed. And that's why so many businesses try that option of getting you to agree to something easy or free at the start because they know that once you agree to that you're less likely to back out when they follow it up with what they really want you to do. Um, now a variation on that is called lowballing. Now lowballing is where the initial request is something more meaningful, something they really want and they agree to it because they think hey this is great, this is what I want but then you follow it up with sort of extra strings attached. You say, well, okay, yes, I will sell you the car for that price, but oh, hold on a minute, there's a, a processing fee. Um, and also, you have to agree to sign up to our service plan where we're the one who repairs your car or services it every year. And again, because you've agreed to the initial request, which is buy my product, and you agreed to it because it was presented to you in such a way that it's a great deal, that even then they now starting adding all these hidden terms and conditions afterwards, you feel like you can't back out. Uh, and I've heard some great examples of this, you know, cars, it seems to be selling cars more than often or not, they use this tactic of the price that you see on the car is not the whole price you'll end up paying, or airlines do this, Ryanair used to be really bad for doing this, that you'd agree to paying what you think is the price of a ticket and then they go, oh, hold on a minute, baggage is extra and check-in costs are extra and we charge you for using credit cards and there are all these he extra fees at the end. But by then you've already committed to the, 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 the sale and you feel like you can't or you shouldn't back out. The best example I've heard of this, though, has to go to the student who told me about a time where they were buying a table and the table was for a great price and they went up and sort of said yeah I want to buy that table and only then do they find out that the legs cost extra 
<laughs> can you imagine that? You're buying a table and the price they show you is not the price including the legs. It's a brilliant example of lowballing. Not exactly very uh, respectable, but incredibly effective. Now, the opposite, or an alternative rather, it's not the opposite, the alternative is to use the first request not to get people hooked, but to make people look more favorably on the second request. So the first request is actually, in this case, something that you don't expect them to say yes to. It's something that's not a very attractive offer. But the whole purpose of it is to make the follow-up request, the target request, look more attractive. Um, and this is what they call framing. You put a nice frame or you present it nicely, the second request, the target one, in the same way you would frame a picture to make the picture look nice. Um, a best example of a framing effect is that um, the first request is deliberately made look unattractive in order to make the second request look attractive. It's called door in the face. So a lot of people, a lot of um, sales pitches, the first price they offer you is not a good price, it's not an attractive price. And then the second price they go, well hold on a minute, that particular item is on sale today, 50% off. And suddenly this, this new price looks really attractive because look there's the old price it was a thousand pounds but now it's only 500 pounds you are saving yourself 500 pounds you'll see that on the sign save yourself 500 pounds by buying this at half price now all you can think of there's the saving but what's really interesting is if you'd walked into that shop and you saw exactly the same product and there was only one price 500 pounds you'd be a little bit less likely to buy it the act of showing you the first price, £1,000, and then going, but wait, 50% off just this week, makes the £500 price look much more attractive than it would have been if it was the only price on show. And this is why so many um, businesses have sales where they say, this product used to cost X, but now it costs Y. By showing you the old price, it makes the new price look more attractive. Um, the sofa companies were particularly notorious for this, telling you that the price used to be something, and it was a price they never ever intended to sell the sofa at. Often the price, the, the old price was a price that only existed for a week, and that's because there was a legal requirement that it must have been a price that was around for at least a week before they could say they were now discounting it. Because it was painfully obvious that they were only giving it the old price in order to make the actual price they wanted to sell it at look more attractive door in the face uh, at its best. Another variation on door in the face is that that's not all approach. This is where you make somebody an initial offer, again which isn't particularly attractive, but then before they can agree or disagree you start throwing in all of these extra additional features to the sale. Um, online um, uh, sort of television ads which were, you know, infomercials were the best at doing this, where they tell you what the product was, they tell you what the price was, and then before you can make up your mind, they say, but wait, we'll also throw in two for the price of one, and, but wait, we'll also throw in these free gloves, these uh, free brushes, these free extra bits. Now, the free extra bits aren't things you particularly need, or even want, but the fact that they're throwing them in makes the initial price now look more attractive. And what's, again, a bit like the first one door in the face, that if they'd just shown you everything at the start, it wouldn't have worked as well. If they'd just shown you everything they were going to offer you for the price at the very start and said, this is everything you're going to get, two bottles, the brushes, the extras, the gloves, and here's the price, that wouldn't be as effective as the way they do it. It's less effective than if they just say initially, oh, hold on, all you're getting is one bottle for the price, and then they start adding in all the extra bits. The initial offer, which isn't attractive, makes the later offer look more attractive. So as you can see, using multiple requests strategically, carefully, can be used to make any offer more attractive. Let's see if I can show you this, these kind of practices uh, in action in the, uh, the advertisement I showed you previously. Having heard about these in theory, let's see how they work in practice. Well, 
look at the ads here. Uh, first thing to look out for, are they presenting anything here just to make something else look more attractive? And I would argue they are. I would argue that the, the, the deal in the middle and the deal at the bottom are not very attractive deals. They're not very good value for money. And they're only being presented because they make the deal at the top look better. Uh, and this is door in the face. So I think the prices and the features being offered in the lower deals, they're not terrible, but they're not very good. And what they do is they make the deal at the top look better than the deal at the top would look if it were just there on its own. So that's door in the face. I would argue that the, the brightly colored icons on the left, which are presenting certain elements of the deal as if they were bonuses, is using a that's not all approach. So initially it looks like you're just getting the phone, but wait, you're also getting the data. And wait, you're getting four months free. And wait, you're getting unlimited text messages. Again, by presenting them as added extras, things they're throwing into your shopping basket as you, as you head for the checkout, it's more attractive than if they were just presented as part and parcel of the deal. And that's why they're in the brightly colored icons as much as anything else. So I think that's a good example of that's not all. Now, in terms of low balling foot in the door. I thought that there was an example of foot in the door here. I certainly pointed towards the terms and conditions as an example of foot in the door when I made this slide. But looking at it later, I've now decided actually no, that's not foot in the door. It's low balling. So both the terms and conditions and the 24 month contract are an example of low balling. Hidden extra strings attached, which you only really become aware of once you signed up for the deal. Now you might argue in a whole, that they're not hiding anything. Look, they make it very clear there's a 24 month contract and they make it very clear that terms and conditions apply. But do they? Do they really make that clear? Those two features are probably the least noticeable features on the entire page. Everything else is much more larger font, bold, capitals, bright colors. Those two bits, the 24 month contract and the terms and conditions, much smaller font, not very bold, not very big, no caps, nothing to draw your eye. So that you'll really, at the only point you'll really become aware of those, I would argue, is after you're, is when you're signing up for the deal. And at that point, you won't feel like backing out and that's low balling. I don't think there's an example of door, foot in the door here now. I've, I've changed my mind since I made the slide. But I think it's enough to show that they're using three of the four te techniques on this one ad alone to show you how widely used these techniques are, and I would argue how effective. All this stuff I'm pointing out to you now, your mind would not consciously process it, but at some level it's taking it all in. And at some level it's steering you subtly towards that top option. Now, if you can say to yourself, well, Cahal, I would have picked the middle one, or I would have picked the bottom one, that's fine. Not everybody is going to be equally affected. But if you can steer the majority towards the option you want, it's still effective overall, and I think that's what these techniques do. Uh, you might imagine that somebody who had just jumped into this presentation in the last few slides could be forgiven for thinking that they might have downloaded the wrong thing. They might be asking themselves, hold on a minute, I, I thought this was about education. I'm not training to be a mobile phone salesman here. And even those of you who've stuck with me since the beginning, and well done, since this is turning out to be a long presentation, you might wonder if in the last few slides I've lost my way and I've started talking about psychology of other areas outside of education without much relevance to education. After all, most educators don't get involved in the marketing or sales of, of their product. In fact, many of them would be very uncomfortable with the idea of viewing education as a product to sell. But let's not get confused between what I'm using as my example and the principles behind that example. I'm using sales as my example because it's something you're all likely to be familiar with more as a customer than as a salesperson, but you at least will recognize some of the techniques that have been used on you in the past. But the techniques themselves, the methods of achieving compliance, aren't limited to being applicable to sales. You could apply them to all sorts of scenarios, including education. And that's something I just want to talk about briefly in this slide. Now, I say in the slide that a lot of educators, educators have no power over their students. Um, looking back on the slide now, I feel maybe that's an overstatement. I'd say almost all educators have some power uh, over their students. It's true that those who work within the education system and often with younger students have maybe more powers, more ability to exercise power than those of us who work with older students or in uh, further education or in the workplace. But even the person who works in a, an environment where there's no formal 
system of uh, the teacher or education having power over their students, educators always exercise some power. Uh, they have some authority, they have the ability to sort of uh, provide or withhold information which can be a way of exercising power if they wish to. But you'll find that a lot of educations or educators are very wary of exercising power over the students, of trying to force their students to do things through obedience. Um, because I think we're all at some level aware of the limitations of such power, that uh, it doesn't create a healthy relationship between the teacher and the student. Often forcing people to do it will cause a resentment, which means that the minute you stop forcing them, they stop doing it. And also, I think a lot of educators feel that that isn't really how an educator should behave. Now, leaving aside the morality of it, I'd have to agree that an educator who only used power and obedience to get the job done is limiting themselves unnecessarily. And this is where compliance comes in. I think educators are far more likely to use compliance, even if they don't realise that that's what they're using, to get the same result, to get people, to get students to do what they want them to do. And often this is sort of simple things in terms of classroom management, but it's also more complex ideas in terms of encouraging students to adopt good habits, encouraging them to take the right approach to their course, encouraging them to engage more or to get to work on their assignments earlier. So I think regularly educators are trying to change the behaviour of their students. In fact, I would say changing the behaviour of students is something that all educators seek to do at some level or another. And I think often as not we're using compliance to achieve that. Um, so what sort of examples can we think of of educators using compliance? And how could those methods be enhanced by the concepts that I've talked about? Well, I've tried to give a few examples here on the slide of situations where an educator might be normally trying to achieve something through compliance. So, um, for example, if you want to uh, get students to talk more in class, and engage more in classroom discussions, that's a form of compliance. You want to try and encourage them to do something. And techniques like ingratiation, you know, flattery, maybe even subtle forms of bribery or agreement are very powerful techniques to use to, to achieve that. I think we underestimate how much it can reward a student and, and thus increase their level of compliance by simply showing a strong approval for them and what they're saying when they participate. Um, so uh, there are other examples I've shown here as well. I think the idea of breaking a bigger project down to smaller, sort of more bite-sized chunks and then getting them to sort of start with something small, whether we knew it or not that it was an example of foot in the door, I think it is an example of foot in the door and I think it works very effectively for that reason. Now, it's obvious that you can use these methods without knowing the concept behind them, but I think that if you engage with the, the writings and the scholarship and the research on these concepts, you'll find there may be ways to refine what you're doing. So you may already know about foot in the door, but I'm only scratching the surface of some of the research out there and some of the ideas out there which have developed this method, which you could use to then inform your practice to give you new insights on how to make it more effective, maybe to find ways of working around it when it doesn't seem to work. So like a lot of uh, theories and concepts in psychology, the idea here is not necessarily to invent a completely new thing that you've never heard of before, but often just to give you a new insight into something you maybe are already fairly familiar with and maybe give you something new about that concept, a new way of approaching it, a new way of seeing it, which can make you more effective when you use it. In conclusion, what are the sort of take-home messages that I would look to see that everybody gets from this presentation that I've just been through with you? I'd say the big one, which applies equally to compliance and conformity, is to showcase exactly how widespread and pervasive social influence is. I think we're all constantly being nudged and, and gently guided, and sometimes not so gently guided, by the forces of social influence, whether they be the two that I've mentioned here, conformity and compliance, or the third one, which is typically seen as obedience, or even I would argue the fourth one, which is not always seen as a form of social influence, which is persuasion. All of these, we are existing in an environment which bombards us with influence all the time, so much so that we've stopped seeing it, even though it's always there. And I think that um, 
As an educator, these influences are just as likely to be featuring in your classroom as they are anywhere else. And that's what you need to know about them. You need to understand how they work. Even if you yourself aren't using them as part of your, your sort of technique, your skill set or your tools, you need to know how they are affecting your students and affecting you just on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of the sort of more specific take-home messages then from the two areas of conformity and compliance, with conformity I would want you to understand that while conformity is something that we all experience and usually it's a product of the groups we belong to, we shouldn't then um, fall into the trap of thinking that that means it's a force that's outside of our control as individuals. We can both sort of change how we are, we ourselves react to conformity and we can change how others are affected by conformity in the things we do and, and this is the idea I was trying to get across when I talked about the factors which increase or decrease levels of conformity. Many of these factors are things that you can control if you wish to and as such as an educator we can both seek to use conformity as one of our tools to enhance it in those places where conformity is likely to produce desirable behaviours and then we seek to minimise it in those places where we believe that conformity is producing undesirable behaviours. Compliance is much more obviously though, a, a tool that an educator can use because it's uh, something that one individual can seek to use on another. And uh, I would, the big idea I've tried to get across here is that firstly we're using compliance more than we realise, that as educators we are quite often seeking to shape people's behaviour by making requests of them rather than delivering orders or relying on conformity to do the job for us. So we're using compliance quite a lot. But the other thing I wanted to get across is how we can learn from sometimes very unlikely sources like advertising and sales, how we can learn to make our use of compliance more effective and how we can use it to be uh, an even more effective sort of tool in our toolkit to encourage students to do the things that we think will help them or will enhance their education. I hope you've enjoyed this and if you're interested to learn more about compliance or conformity you'll find more details even in the most introductory of textbooks which talk about these or an introductory social psychology textbook or even just an introduction to psychology textbook will have a wealth of other smaller details and concepts connected to these that I haven't had time to go through today. Thanks very much for listening.